start. Um, good morning, good afternoon, buon pomeriggio, buongiorno a tutte e a tutti. Welcome back, uh, everyone, to Ottocentismi's lecture series for the new academic year. I am Silvia Vallisa, I'm the host of today's event. Um, very quickly, also because since we started a little late because of the technical issue, I just wanted to, as many of you already know, um, mention that um, Ottocentismi is an interdisciplinary network born out of our desire to give more visibility to the Italian and European Ottocento and to promote conversations on everything that is Ottocento related. Um, we have been organizing our lecture series since 2021, and we have two events in the series this fall. Today, we introduce this uh, wonderful new book release that you also dis see displayed on the screen. Um, and on November 10th, always a Friday at the same time, we will discuss and present the work of the Fondazione Verga um, with Gabriella Alfieri, Andrea Monganaro, uh, Daria Motta, and Milena Giuffrida. And that event will be in Italian. Today's event is mainly in English, but with some Italian uh, uh, small parts. Uh, we have more events planned for the spring and more initiatives are ahead. Um, so keep tuned, stay tuned for uh, more information. Um, so with that, welcome to today's event. We are honored to have uh, Adrian Ward and Irene Zanini-Cordi with us, the curators and editors, translators of this beautiful, sorry, of this beautiful book just out for University of Toronto on press. Thank you, Irene and uh, um, Adrian, for being here with us today. Um, as I mentioned to you yesterday, I am really at the very end of the book. I'm reading the last pages today, um, and it has been such an, an absolute treat to read both the, the text that you bring to our attention, that you make available for us, both, both in Italian and in English, uh, but also for the, your incredibly rich and thoughtful analysis. So um, I learned so much from this book, and I'm really looking forward to today's presentation to um, learn even more um, about your work and about these women. Um, so I will let Irene and Adrian talk directly, of course, about their work. The format is usually a lecture presentation followed by a QA, and a um, and the event usually lasts about an hour and 15 minutes. Um, um, so we'll try today to, to stay within those limits. I only wanted to say a few words of introduction about our guests. Irene is Associate Professor of Italian Studies, uh, my colleague at Florida State University. She specializes in modern Italian culture, women writers in particular, in a transhistorical lens from salon culture to contemporary writers like Elena Ferrante and Maria Lai. Um, uh, her first book explored Abbandono ed Identità Femminile nella letteratura italiana, which is also part of the title of the book. And she is currently working on a second monograph that combines social network theory, Italian salons and saloniers, and women writing in 18th and 19th century Italy. Adrian Ward is Emerita Professor at University of Virginia. She specializes in 17th and 18th century Italian literature with a focus on theater production and culture. She has worked on representations of China in 18th century Italian opera, a theme that she focused on for her first book and has published on Goldoni, on Luisa Bergalli and Fulvio Testi. So together they are the editors and translators of this beautiful volume and we are excited to hear more about uh, them and their work. Quindi a voi la parola, please join me in welcoming Adrian and Irene. Grazie, grazie moltissime Silvia per l'introduzione. Thank you all for being here this morning and uh, we also want to thank um, on top of Professor Valisa for inviting us to present our work, uh, Professor Gabriella Romani and uh, Professor Corradi for facilitating this event. Uh, the whole group uh, of uh, Ottocentismi. Um, thank you. Uh, I will talk about the structure and components part uh, of our uh, book, while Adrian will address our analysis of uh, Veronese's text, especially her strategic use of uh, autobiographical genre in the crafting of a celebrity self. So uh, courting celebrity, as you might have uh, understood from Sylvia's uh, uh, introduction, 
It's an offshoot of my main ongoing research project on Italian Saloniers and their writings from uh, just before the French Revolution to the Italian unification. It is a bilingual annotated edition of Angela Veronese's uh, autobiography, which she published in 1826. To better elucidate Veronese's thinking and her cultural background, our book includes uh, the 1825 autobiography of a contemporary but much more famous uh, poet improviser, Teresa Bandettini. Bandettini's autobiographia remained in manuscript form, however, until about 30 years ago, when it was transcribed in the appendix of Alessandra Di Rico's uh, volume L'Inutile e Meraviglioso Mestiere, Poeti Improvisatori del Settecento. But who was Angela Veronese? We tried to reconstruct her life without uh, relying on her autobiography. And it was difficult to find sources, especially for the first part of her life, largely because she was of humble origins. We know that she was born in the territory of the Republic of Venice in the Veneto region in 1778, more precisely in the village of Biadene near Conegliano, northwest of Treviso, the area of the Prosecco. Um, she was the daughter of uh, a gardener who was employed in the estates of Venetian patricians. Her father uprooted the family frequently because of his job. In a 36 year span, according to her autobiography, they moved nine times within the Venice area. The first uh, truly documentable data is the publication in 1804 or of her first collection of poems. And at this point, she was 26 years old and living with her family on the Villa Spineda property in Breda del Piave near Treviso. And here you have Villa Spineda today, as it has been restored. This is the back of the villa with uh, the vineyard. And uh, um, just for fun, an inside picture of the villa and possibly Veronese was uh, circulating in this environment as she describes paintings and statues. The person in the center is a resident artist uh, at this point in time. So this was the period when, while living on the Terraglio Road, she met and circulated with nobility and intellectuals, including the Countess Isabella Teotocchi Albrizzi, Ippolito Pindemonte, Ugo Foscolo, Jacopo Vittorelli. The Venetian nobility spent summers at their countryside villas. It was likely that they would have taken notice of a local child prodigy, and Veronese's accounts of social occasions where she claimed that she mingled with such learned people are entirely plausible. 1804, the year of her first publication, is also the year she met Melchiorre Cesarotti, then a professor of rhetoric and classics at the University of Padova. Mario Pieri's diary entries of 1806 testify to her association with Cesarotti's coterie and to her contact with the celebrated Salonier Isabella Teotocchi Albrizzi. Here he writes, and I quote, she, with very little learning and little reading, writes anacreontic poems full of delicacy and grace, very close to those of the famous anacreontic poet Vittorelli, end of quote. Cesarotti was instrumental in the publication of her second poetry collection in 1807, Rime Pastorali di Aglaia Nessilide where her adoption of the pastoral name, Aglaia Nassilide, signals her official entry into contemporary academic culture. This second collection of poems was published by Niccolò Bettoni, the same press that published Vincenzo Monti's works and Foscolo's De Sepolcri. When Cesarotti died in 1808, Veronese was deeply affected Nevertheless, uh, she was uh, embraced by his circle of friends and admirers, and her poetic life uh, seems to have thrived. During this period, she met the celebrated improviser Teresa Bandettin in Arcadia, known as uh, Amarilla Etrusca, with whom she exchanged the verses. In 1814, when she was about 36, Veronese married a man of her same social status, Antonio Mantovani and moved to Padova. Marriage did not prevent her from having a social life and her publishing activity increased. 
in uh, 1818 uh, in a publication titled Parnaso dei Poeti Anacreontici, so the best of the Anacreontic poets, she was one of the few women to be featured together with Sappho, Teresa Bandettini, and uh, Elisabetta Caminer Turra. In uh, 1822 collection, Scelta di Poesie di 70 Autori Viventi, she appears uh, with the likes of Ippolito Pindelmonte, Vincenzo Monti, Alessandro Manzoni, Giacomo Leopardi, and Ugo Foscolo. She was uh, an assiduous composer of uh, occasional poetry, regularly wrote verses uh, honoring various life's events, births, deaths, clerical vows, marriages, devotion to family pets. An example is her 1822 booklet of uh, six poems uh, commemorating sculptor Antonio Canova's death. And uh, here we have uh, a playful example of one of those publications where her name appears uh, together with those of other occasional poets, mostly male, and you can see her at the very bottom of the base of the amphora as Aglaia Anasilide. <clears throat> she also made her mark in the music sphere and is listed as a librettista in some of Giovanni Battista Perutini's Ariette. In 1824, she is featured in Ginevra Canonici Facchini's Prospetto Biografico delle Donne Italiane Rinomato in Letteratura. She is now 46 and well established in the Veneto area. The biographical sketch considers her a pupil of Cesarotti and also mentions her adverse economic fortune. A year later, an edition of her poems was published in Moscow and some were set to music. Now, in 1826, Veronese published her autobiography. It was her first prose writing titled Notizie, it prefaced the most extensive collection of her poems to date. The work on the whole is entitled Versi di Aglaia Nassiride, aggiunti le notizie della sua vita scritte da lei medesima. The autobiographical section, Notizie, was the part of the book uh, um, that uh, commanded the most attention. Writers and critics complimented it while also pointing to its shortcomings. Between 1826 and her death in 1847, her lyrics and prose appeared in at least 40 publications, anthologies, opuscoli, strenne. Veronese eventually expanded her repertoire into fiction. In 1836, she published the short novel Eurosia, a tragic love story characterized by the realism of its characters and their country environment. In these years, her friendship with the writer Luigi Carrer and his support were very important. In his uh, eulogy for her death, Carrer stresses how her canzoncine, known and sung by everyone all over the Veneto region, best described her character. He described them as, and I quote, canzoncine composed with a matched feeling and spontaneity. This is our table of contents. As you can see, uh, we present Veronese's original autobiography and our translation. Then we offer a selection of 25 of her poems. We chose uh, those uh, that were specifically mentioned in the autobiography and those that uh, had a direct relevance uh, to her life story. Next, uh, we have our biography of Veronese and uh, a summary of which I've just uh, given. One of the most valuable parts of our book may well be the biobibliography that we provide. It is the result of our extensive research on Veronese's publications, both primary sources and secondary literature. We have uh, an understandably briefer section on Bandettin, given that lots of scholarship already exists on her. We offer the transcription of her manuscript autobiography and its translation and a concise uh, uh, biography. And here is the first page of Bandettini's uh, autobiographical manuscript that is uh, in the library in Lucca and uh, a close up. Um, instead uh, of a canonical introduction, our analysis of the autobiographies uh, comes at the end of our book. We titled it uh, Contexts and Conclusions. 
And our intention was to foreground these women's voices before adding our own. We end with a sonnet by Luigi Carrer in memory of Aglaia Nassilide and the general bibliography. Now, before I finish, I want to point out that the book back cover, of, uh, the back cover of our book, uh, features a photo of an 18th century Venetian commode with mirror. The painting uh, on this furniture show how Arcadian culture permeated the Venetian material culture. We took uh, our front cover illustrations depicting two women performing from the sides uh, of the mirror. And uh, this medallion, um, which is at the very center of the commode, gives us a lovely idea of the kind of Arcadian gatherings uh, that are so ubiquitous uh, in uh, Veronese's time. Thank you, Irene. I just had to figure out how to unmute. <laughs> um, <clears throat> What struck us most about Veronese's autobiography are all the ways in which she actively markets herself and her literary work. And how does she do that? She creates and presents a number of different identities. We single out three, and the first one we call her Arcadian self. Veronese took advantage of the Arcadian literary movement, and indeed Arcadian culture. As many of you know, it was born in Rome in, late, in the late 17th century, and by her time, the Arcadian Academy had grown to a network of nearly 40 outposts across the peninsula. This medallion helps us visualize what one of their gatherings might have been like. They revered, the, the Arcadian members revered Greek and Roman literary forms and subject matter, especially pastoral literature. They gathered at formal assemblies and often outside less formally in natural settings where they dressed as shepherds or mythical woodland inhabitants. At these gatherings, they would share the short lyrical verses and dramas they had written, which centered on these same mythological figures and their relationships and concerns. The Arcadians competed in literary games and contests, which almost always included poetry recitation. And this was the kind of poetry that Veronese wrote, anacreontics, sonnets, odes, epigrams classic Arcadian lyric forms. And she presents herself in Notizie, that's her, the title of her autobiography, as the ideal author of such poetry. She does so by capitalizing on her lowly origins. Recall that she is a gardener's daughter. So more than others, she can truly embody the rustic Arcadian maiden figure in the eyes of those whose interests she courts. She highlights her essence as a child of nature, over one third of the autobiography concerns her childhood. And this reminds readers of her Arcadian qualities of innocence and spontaneity. She also stresses her autodidacticism, which supports her role as an authentic Arcadian native once again. That is, she's unsophisticated, naive, artless. She's incapable of artifice and empty intellectualism. Finally, she emphasizes her peasant virtue, the integrity of the humble ranks. This again reinforces Arcadian poetics, where those who live close to the land are considered more pure of heart and unpretentious. And by way of example, on the very first page of her autobiography, when she introduces her parents, she says that they were poor and honest people, two qualities that, I quote, are almost always paired together, unquote. Arcadian assemblies were the primary venue for improvised poetic performance, and Veronese leverages her remarkable literary skills, especially in this area. First, she presents herself as a prodigy, and then she becomes sought after entertainment for the nobility. Even though she never became a professional, as Bandettini, would, uh, as Bandettini was, she makes the most of all the ways in which she participated in that world. In a moment, we'll hear some excerpts that reference her love of improvising as a girl, but equally significant are the way the autobiography recreates her later performative moments by recollecting details of a particular occasion. She tells us who was there, who or what prompted her to versify, how quickly she whipped up a poem. She gives us its first few lines, 
or maybe a couple of lines at the, uh, in, at the very end. And she relates how her audience reacted and responded. These many recollections have a documentary feel. The who, what, when, where details validate her real history with improvising and of course her abilities. A second self that Veronese puts forth is her network self. Notizia reveals numerous mechanics of social networking and that Veronese knew very well how to work that system. Her network self is most evident as she narrates her activities in terms of people, places, and the events that became occasions for performative poetry. She does a lot of name dropping. She cites 56 persons in all compared to Banditini's nine. And in doing so, she traces chains and matrices of social connection. She tells her reader who knew who, who introduced her to who, who sent her poem to who, essentially how knowledge of her and her verses traveled along social channels. And here's an example. She shows us how her friendship, or she tells us how her friendship with the abbot Angelo Dal Mistro led to a connection with the abbot Francesconi and so on, uh, leading to Porro, Ferdinando Porro, whose uh, larger circle of friends thus expands her connections. This is the series of links that allowed Veronese to get one of her poems to the Princess Amalia di Bavaria, as she tells us after this, this chain we're looking at. VIPs like Cesarotti were naturally the most fruitful nodes in these networks, linking her to the many people in his circle. And again, when Veronese mentions who requested or received a poem, or who recommended her to someone, or who sent a gift in gratitude, all of this serves both as a tribute to the patron, and it calls out her access and connectedness. On the topic of gifts, gift giving or exchange was yet another form of networking. It reified the social commerce. It was material evidence of various relationships. Veronese first learns about the power of presence when she gives and gets treats from the peasants she lives among. Then when she is closer to the elites, she remarks on numerous gifting moments. She receives books, poems, jewelry, accessories, and money as reward for her poetic creations. Naming both the gift item and her benefactor underscores her associations yet again with all these people. Another way Veronese networked was by describing the gardens of the villas her family lived among. She describes six gardens in all. Her detailed descriptions advertise and promote the nobility's wealth, taste, and power, as well as their literary aptitudes and aspirations. And it, it's helpful to remember that gardens evoked the classical locus amoenus, key to the Arcadian ethos. Thus, Venetians often fashioned their villa gardens to imitate, in some degree, the Bosco Parasio, which was the Arcadian Academy's official meeting place in Rome. Veronese's, Veronese's garden reviews again underscore the naturalness of her role as intermediary between the higher and lower classes. As the child of the gardening expert, the garden curator, she bridges her origins and the spheres of those whose patronage she desires. Literary portraits were yet another way she networked. The written or literary portrait was a trend engaged in most notably by Venetian noblewoman Isabella Teotocchi Albrizzi. Veronese weaves 15 literary portraits into her text, which support her relationships with her subjects and her belonging to their circles. And here's an example of the one she did for Ugo Foscolo. Irene will read the Italian. Un giorno essa, Countess Grimaldi Prati, mandò a levarmi nel suo carrozzino, onde farmi personalmente conoscere il celebre Ugo Foscolo. Il suo vestito di panno grigio scuro, senza alcun segno di moda, i suoi capelli rossi, radati come quelli di uno schiavo, il suo viso rubicondo, tinto, non so se dal sole oppure dalla natura, i suoi occhi vivacissimi, occhi azzurri, semi nascosti sotto le sue lunghe palpebre, le sue labbra grosse come quelle di un etiope, la sua sonora ed ululante voce, me il dipinsero a prima vista per tutt'altro che per elegante poeta. 
egli appena mi vide s'alzò da sedere dicendo è questa la saffo campestre è molto ragazza si vede dai suoi occhi che vera poetessa il suo complimento mi fece ridere gran bei denti esclamò egli ditemi alcuni dei vostri versi dietro a queste sue lodi non mi sembrò più tanto brutto the third identity we discuss is veronese's literary market savvy self she exhibits a lot of know-how about the publishing and literary arena and it, this comes out both in the structure and the content of her autobiography as for its structure despite the title of the whole work which presents notizie as secondary to the versi and you see that here where the clearly the main the whole work is entitled versi di aglaia nasilide to which is to which is uh, added the information on her life the truth is that the autobiography comes first in the volume it doesn't follow the poems it's the first item and it also is one third of the page count of this whole collection which tells us something about uh, its its uh, role its importance insofar as it introduces all the poems that follow and it really anchors them when Veronese mixes in bits of her poetry with the prose. I mentioned earlier, she'll give us a couple lines of a poem and invite, essentially invite the reader to recall that moment or imagine the rest of the poem. Doing so allows the verses to support her life story. The poems recreate moments. They propel the narrative and validate her connections. Bandettini doesn't mobilize poetry at all in this way in her manuscript. Irene and I have also hypothesized that when Veronese inserts only a portion of her poem, it might possibly function as a kind of mnemonic trick where she reminds a reader of a past occasion or prompts them to recall the whole poem and, of course, keep on remembering her along the way. Regarding the substance or the content, content of her text, we've mentioned gardens and literary portraits, We must also note the profusion of people, places, and events that show how Veronese understood instinctively the appeal of gossip, inside information, reflections on the social classes. Notizie is full of vignettes and anecdotes, some funny, some wistful or sad. It contains jokes and wry observations. It feels colloquial, spontaneous, and perceptive. Very importantly, Veronese's renditions, especially of peasant life, where she embraces a more realistic and direct treatment of the ordinary individual, show her transitioning from Arcadian standards to romantic poetics and romanticism. She very well comprehends the evolving literary landscape and adjusts adeptly. And now we're going to move to some excerpts. The first ones that we'll show you in just a sec right now. The first ones show how each uh, woman author began to improvise as a girl. They have both been reading and hearing poetry, verses such as Metastasio's, and it spurs them to mimic the improvising activity. First we have Veronese. In quella lunghissima convalescenza cominciarono in me a scintillare le prime faville di ardore a Pollini. Passava l'intere giornata sola nella mia cameretta, con la cara compagnia del tomo di Metastasio, che io sapeva quasi a memoria. Stanca del continuo leggere, passeggiava con aria distratta, recitando senza regole declamatorie ciò che aveva già letto cento volte, ed annoiata di replicare sempre le stesse cose, ne creava bizzarramente di nuove. Tutto quel tempo che io non era tormentata dalla terzana, lo ero dalla smania poetica, Improvvisava soletta i miei poveri versi con libero entusiasmo, non avendo altri spettatori che le statue e gli alberi del giardino. And now Bandettini. Sull'aria di questa o di quella canzonetta che udiva cantar per la strada, vi adattava all'improvviso versi di mia invenzione, con gran sorpresa di mia madre, la quale era sempre il subietto delle mie rime. Ella, per mia fortuna, sapeva pur anche improvvisare in ottava rima, né sempre si ricusava a rispondermi quando io la invitava a cantare. Questo era il miglior dono che potesse farvi, poiché anteponeva ad ogni divertimento il piacere di improvvisare. 
quando per la sopravveniente sera più non poteva leggere e molto meno scrivere, figurava di tensionare con un emulo in ottava rima, ponendomi in un canto della mia camera, e quindi, saltando nell'altro posto, rispondeva alla proposta da me fatta prima. Now each woman talks about learning how to write. They were both self-taught, and they both point to this exceptionalism in their life stories. First, Veronese. Verso i 14 anni si destò in me la brama di imparare assolutamente a scrivere. Una vecchia tabacchiera, dismessa da mio padre, fu il mio primo calamaio. Il fanciullo maestro mi regalò una penna, un po' di inchiostro, delle soprascritte di lettere raccolte nella fattoria, che per allora mi servivano di libro. Dietro a ciò che io leggeva, incominciai a segnare le prime lettere. Io appoggiava la carta stampata ad una poesia fatta per messa nuova o per nozze ad una finestra, stendeva sopra di quella una pagina del mio libro e scriveva arditamente, aiutata dal lume del giorno, ciò che aveva letto e riletto tanto volte di notte. E now Bandettini? Ma per imitare quel numero che i versi mi davano all'orecchio, mi posi a scrivere non avendo altro esempio che quello dei libri stampati, stampatello. Chissà quali saranno state le lettere da me usate, ma io le intendeva e ciò bastava, perché io, ad imitazione dei ritmi del Petrarca, componessi canzoni, ballate e sonetti, ed ora certe dette da me commedie in versi martelliani, servendomi di guida il Goldoni, come Puranco, cantate dietro la lettura del Metastasio. The next topic is women's virtue, and both autobiographies are conscious of the question of women's honor and the pressure on women to protect their reputations. Veronese writes of her first encounter with Foscolo. Mi feci coraggio e gli recitai un mio idilio pastorale che gli applaudì avvicinandosi a me più che non permetteva la decenza della vita civile. And before we go to Bandettini, Uh, we want to note that the issue of womanly virtue is much more prevalent in her text. And this is because in addition to writing verse, Bandettini is a ballet dancer working for some of the well-known traveling companies. She herself uses the phrase women of the theater to indicate the risks and bad reputations often associated with female stage performers. Giovanni Pindemonte, one of several men who fall for Bandettini, is frustrated that she doesn't return his affection And now we'll hear uh, how she writes about his eruption to her, her mother. Come soffrite, gridava, che vostra figlia con tanto ingegno e una così facile vena di improvvisare, confusa vada con una sorta di donne che altro non sanno che vendere i loro favori al più offerente? Chi l'avrebbe creduto? Tanta cultura, tante cognizioni e in una ballerina? And the next quote uh, concerns her relationship with another suitor, a later suitor, Alberto Fortis, and it reveals still more about the danger that public performing entailed for women. Bandettini's story of their tempestuous meetings reprises mainstays of courtship and seduction novels, where virtue is assailed but courageously upheld and rewarded, and here we bolded some of those conventions. Fortis has written Bandettini a letter And Bandettini tells us that in this letter, he warns us to consider al disonore che io faceva a me stessa essendo accomunata con gente che pensano con le gambe, onde non esitare un istante ad accettare la sua proposizione. Questa lettera mi pose in gran pensiero, ma ancor che giovane, pur mi parve in essa ravvisare il linguaggio della seduzione, e cominciai a diffidare dell'onestà di un uomo che mi consigliava una fuga strappandomi dalle braccia materne ed esponendomi alla giusta critica dei miei conoscenti. The next excerpts regard each woman's thoughts on her marriage partner. Each will consult with her parent, in Veronese's case her father, Bandettini with her mother, over this important decision. The criteria for a good marriage uh, or a good husband include the woman's future financial well-being above all, her literary aspirations, class considerations, and individual happiness. We'll hear Veronese's words first. 
Erano scorsi quattro anni da che io mi ritrovavo a Ponte Longo, allora quando ebbi a conoscere un giovine mantovano, di bella figura, di aggradevole fisionomia, di animo sincero, di cuore affettuoso. Il rispetto che gli professava la poesia, anche senza conoscerla, me la rese al caro. Un giorno il mio genitore me lo propose per marito, dicendomi «Lo credo degno di te, perché sembra buono come un angelo». Diventando sua moglie tu potrai leggere e scrivere a tuo piacere. Ti bramo felice. Già il matrimonio non è che un lotto. Chi vince e chi perde. Il tutto sta in mano della fortuna. Feci qualche riflesso sulle sue parole. Pensai che il padre non vive sempre e che la poesia in questi secoli non è premiata che di allori, di applausi e di ringraziamenti. And now Bandettini tells us what her mother said to her on the subject. Sentimi, Teresa, mia età e più i disgusti da me sofferti possono abbreviare la mia vita. Tu sei giovane e con tutto lo studio che fatto hai su libri non conosci gli uomini. Tu hai duopo di chi ti protegga. Landucci ti chiede a sposa, non dico che questo partito sia buonissimo, ma pure ai suoi vantaggi. Il giovane è onesto, eccellente nella sua professione, ha una non dubbia speranza di poter un giorno dar le spalle al teatro, e vivere tranquillamente. Inoltre è dotato d'un cuore fatto per apprezzarti. Sentimi, io ti vedrei malvolentieri congiunta ad un uomo nobile di nascita perché temerei che un giorno, pentito, non facesse di te un conto, onde tu non potendo conversare né coi tuoi uguali né con quelli di tuo marito, saresti costretta a piangere lungamente. Il giovane che ti richiede è tuo pari. Io lo stimo atto a renderti felice. Pensaci. We next show you one of our favorite of Veronese's poems. She labeled it her naughtiest epigram. And she tells us that it came to be when she was reading a poem to a small group. Impressed by her bravura, a nobleman listener snatched the fan away from a nearby nobile donna and gave it to Veronese, just on, right on the spot. Shortly afterward, Veronese composed this epigram based on the fan's illustration of the gods Love and Hymen. This is not the exact fan, obviously, but we found one we thought would be a um, suitable, um, very similar, as it depicts this beautiful painted illustration, and it's from the 18th century. Citerea gridava, Aita, perché amor l'avea ferita, Imeneo che il grido udì, corse tosto, e amor fuggì. We end um, saying that we're very grateful for this opportunity today and also we hope in the future to bring these wonderful texts to wider audiences of students and scholars and a larger community. And we end with the book's dedication to women and their stories told and to all women and their stories told and untold. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Adrian. Thank you, Irene. Uh, let me clap also with my icon. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, this was um, such a wonderful introduction to um, to both your work and uh, um, and these two women. Um, and thank you for including her the voices of Veronese and Bandettini and for giving us already a sense of how um, how original, how fresh, how relatable they both are. Um, of course, we are going to open um, right away the floor for questions, comments, uh, um, suggestions. Um, I did want to just sort of um, start off the, the conversation uh, by saying that um, just as you mentioned, your, um, your decision to uh, literally editorial decision to literally build the book by giving their Italian voice first, then their English voice, and then your comment, your contextualization, your historical background and your bibliography um, is such a wonderful editorial decision because it really sort of uh, just throws us in into uh, their voices. We get to enjoy them so much. And then uh, we get in a way all of the questions that we might have had or all of the uh, sort of unclear things, they get clarified and they get explained uh, uh, thanks to, to your book. 
Um, so uh, already that to me is sort of just, just you know, the marker of success of this book for all that it does for the reader. Um, another couple of things that I wanted to say was that um, I, I do think, like I said, from already from the quotes that we get, uh, we, we, we get a sense of these remarkable uh, voices and subjectivities of, of these women. And you have given us a few a few examples of the ways in which they can be read. Um, one question that I had because I, because you you treat it so well in in the um, in in your contextualization in the book, um, and we didn't have a chance to cover it today uh, so quickly is um, that uh, when we talk about Veronese's text, you also have this important claim, which is that this is the very first modern autobiography by um, a woman, um, and you do clarify that also in the text. You know, because some people say Camilla Fa Gonzaga is the first modern autobiography by a woman, but I, I found that you uh, actually explained so well, uh, right, what you mean, uh, like how how you're 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 talking about this, and you give us a genealogy of of autobiography. So if you wanted to maybe expand a little bit more on that uh, for us. Grazie. Should I start, Adrian? Sure, yeah. sure. Okay. Thank you, Silvia. Yes, uh, um, you're right. Um, what struck us in this autobiography is um, mostly the fact that uh, um, Angela Veronese writes it with the intention to publish it, and she sees it through publication. So, for us, uh, the concern is not a spiritual concern, like it could have been in the past, um, but um, we also stress the economic uh, um, intention that is probably there in the crafting of uh, the self that she puts forward. So um, her celebrity uh, comes through the autobiography, through uh, the little things and the little moments uh, of her life. And uh, um, it's uh, that uh, kind of celebrity that she wants uh, to put forward in order to promote herself. So for me, in this sense, uh, um, the autobiography inscribes itself into a new trend where women can tell their story. And it's a story in the public eye. It's not uh, in a convent. It's not uh, relegated to family. It's not uh, just a confessional, spiritual um, uh, situation, but um, there is the publicity of it all, and uh, the novelty here, I think it's the language that she employs. Uh, as you've seen, it's even simpler than Bandetti, a plainer kind of language, but very ironic, sarcastic at times, and uh, um, she gives her insight uh, on uh, the real life of the people around her, of the uh, farmers uh, of the countryside in the Venice region and the gossip of the higher classes. So um, for me, it's especially this, uh, it's the idea of uh, we have this woman who conceives of uh, uh, writing an autobiography as a means of uh, uh, promoting herself. So there is this kind of modernity here. I would add too that we we point out the difference between a secular and the previous kinds of women's autobiographies that were largely confessional or devotional oftentimes, or the content is shaped by the audience they imagine, which it could be a single judge or uh, a confessor or spiritual director, small tribunal. But here, the content is shaped by as big an audience as she can man as she can get. And in fact, she has 400 subscribers listed at the end of her autobiography, which is which are people that may have helped to finance the publishing of the work itself. Yeah. They're not automatically buyers. Um, one one assumes they're buyers as well. But um, she she writes about her accomplishments in a world her worldly accomplishments. She's not writing about her spiritual development or her uh, dedication to family specifically she is writing about the strides she made in a very secular um uh, literary and uh, world full of social capital and in that sense it's it's very much uh, a more modern autobiography than what has come before absolutely absolutely thank you um 
everything that you've touched on, we could expand more. Uh, I'm going to open up if there's questions from the audience. Gabri. Oh, uh, or Susan. Non so chi vuole andare. Susan, go ahead. Hi, yeah, um, thanks so much. I uh, had the chance to to read the book too, and I really enjoyed it. I'm so very happy to to be here today for the for the presentation. Um, I, I mean, I know a few of you, so I've, I work on Justina Joni Michiel, um, and one of the things that I that's been interesting to me is sort of afterlife of her publications after her death, and so you see that they get you know her festive in Iziana, get re-edited throughout the century. And there are also publications of letters to and from her um, that get published throughout the century with many um, being published in the 1880s, um, you know, when we went into the market, literary marketplace in more greater numbers. So I was just wondering about the afterlife of Edonese and if there's interest in her work after her death. And so she's able to seed the way in which people talk about her um, through her autobiography. I could begin there. Um, unfortunately, she's not picked up until the 70s, which is the first edition of her, uh, um, the first edition after the 1826, the original edition. And the um, that's Manlio Pastore Stocchi who, who edits that work. And he, like so many, so many before her critics, present her in terms of her autobiography. You use, summarize the autobiography, reprise the autobiography basically to introduce her. So there isn't much attention paid to the, to uh, measuring the, the facts against what she says. And um, they also tend to put her in a small, very restrictive box of a woman who just uh, was very, um, uh, uh, downtrodden in a way by her social class limitations. And that when she lost the um, the spotlight of the elites, as she did as she aged and 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 um, and impro poetic improvising also went out of style eventually, that she just was sort of captive to her social class limitations. So it's a very reductive um not very exploratory or investigative view of Veronese and, and absolutely no appreciation for what she tells us in this autobiography, what she lays bare in front of us. Yeah, I would add that uh, really there is, after her death, there isn't much uh, reprinting of her poems, uh, maybe here and there in some strene or occasional publications. But um, she kind of, um, her fame died off uh, with her person and also with an era, it sounds like, you know, because she was a, um, a character that was uh, in between uh, the long 18th century and the new romanticism coming in uh, with her production. And she adapted towards the end of her life uh, to focus more on the realistic trends and sentimental trends. But um, no, her work hasn't been really brought uh, to the attention of uh, a wider public uh, um, as uh, Renier Michel um, has. And I think uh, um, Adrian is right that the social status here is also um, a big issue in the memory because uh, um, they were not canonical writers in any way. Thank you. Yeah, everybody go ahead. Um, oops, sorry. I was trying to, okay. Um, well, Susan took my question, so I have, it's okay. Uh, um, you actually asked it uh, in a much more elaborated than my mind. Although I was thinking that I'm not surprised that in the 70s that the social uh, issue, the class issue um, came up by the critics reading her work. Um, I guess my question is somewhat related to that. Um, and as we as we know, um, women who uh, entered uh, literary activities, women who wrote until 
uh, really all the way to the end of the 19th century was thought and, and beyond was thought as a monstrosity, you know, as unnatural, as a natural act um, for um, a woman who um, physiologically, not only intellectually and cognitively, was not uh, seen as naturally prone to thinking and writing. Um, and uh, so I was wondering whether maybe you could tell us a little more whether beyond this masking, because, you know, she constructs her public image. She wants to be seen, and I'm mainly uh, referring to Angela Veronese, uh, beyond her, so whether at all you sense and you saw that along this building of her public image, a building as a reputation, there was um, a strong fragility there as a woman, not only who wrote, but a woman coming from a social class considered very far from that world, almost subhuman uh, in uh, class issues. And um, there must have been, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm just curious because this is, I think it's, it tells us also a different story that is as important as the one of self-affirmation, you know, self-invention, self-affirmation, but also how she deals with uh, the fact that she's not only a woman who writes, but it's a, a woman from a class that is not considered almost human. Right. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I'll, um, I'll begin because um, I have a really interesting, I've been teaching Veronese's also biography in my graduate course for a while. And uh, students always loved the autobiography. They were reading it in Italian, but recently, I've had the chance to work uh, um, with the, my our translation and undergraduate uh, student reading it. And their uh, response was, this is so fascinating because uh, the way this woman tells her story is empowering. And they use the word empowering and I had never really thought it about it that way. But um, I can see how uh, that is the case. Um, Veronese, make sure that her readership knows that she is not a farmer's daughter, but a gardener's daughter. So the social concern is there from the very beginning of uh, the autobiography. Then we have a here and there, every time she's narrating, um, taking parts in social gatherings, going with the nobility to some uh, thermal resort uh, for a celebration of sort. Her father is uh, telling her, reminding her of her social status and of her place in society. So the social issue is coming up and up. But um, she is depicting herself as uh, overcoming obstacles. And the father is a great support here. Obstacles could be the mother that doesn't want her to learn to write, absolutely not, but not even to read possibly, right? Because it's not necessary for a woman. And um, so reading, writing, uh, mingling with uh, a different social class. Um, the issue of modesty that we brought up uh, um, with our uh, quotes before comes up, but not as much as in Bandettini. Um, she makes sure, she tells us that she knew her place in the social ladder. And uh, her interactions with the, the world that surrounded her and these uh, higher class people or authors uh, is uh, within her uh, carved uh, niche. And uh, another fascinating thing that she does, uh, at least uh, we interpret it this way in the autobiography, is uh, to craft uh, her image uh, as a child of a pastoral world. Okay, so that can last uh, so long, as long as she's young and a child, but uh, it puts her in the uh, role of uh, one of these archaic characters uh, that were, um, you know, lively in the Arcadian performances. And so she enters the literary world through that image of the genius child, the poet, improviser, the shepherdess, uh, the gardener's daughters, it's like a real shep shepherdess for Marcelia. Um, so that's her entryway into the higher status. Uh, 
um, as you've seen, um, getting a husband at 36, if I'm not mistaken, pretty late in life, is a meditate a calculated decision. And uh, her father says, you can keep uh, reading and writing and do what you want with this person because uh, he understands that. But it's within her social level. Um, I don't see the fragility. I must say that uh, going back to my students' comments on empowering, she just pushes through, or at least this is the way she presents herself. At the end, um, she's older, she is alone, she's a widow, she is poor, and um, she's probably in dire straits of sort, but she still has friends, but um, she is resigned, and there's that uh, religious Catholic feeling of, uh, you know, I've had a good life. I have uh, what I needed to be happy. And I'm a poet and I, I've been able to do what I wanted. So um, this is my interpretation. This is also why I like it a lot as a piece of writing, you know, because it feels genuine. Although there are many mechanisms of self-construction at place that makes her think that she was pretty, um, pretty smart. Mm, what the way she was presenting herself. I I would add something too, um, Gabriella, that um, we I we don't have much that helps us know how she held up or pushed through. You know, other than her own the image she crafts, which does seem pretty um, empowering, as Irene says. But we know that what she was up against were some of the things like critics that described her as ugly because. Apparently, she was not as uh, breathtaking as the noble women who get, you know, described for their beauty. Um, she she was dark. Her skin was dark, likely because she was outside and, you know, the, lots of sun. And that was, a you know, that was against her in, the, in terms of beauty standards. And it's remarked on. And then later, uh, later, when she's being considered for inclusion in an anthology, we have a letter from Leopardi who's writing to the editor of the anthology or is, is part of the maybe the selection team. And he says the fact that uh, this uh, Veronese, the fact that she worked the land might be in her favor. So for inclusion, meaning now the romantic sensibility has taken greater hold and someone who has this close relationship with nature and the land um, the more working working class connection um, might be good. So I don't know if that's if we value that a good or a bad thing or where on the spectrum. But those are the kinds of those are some other things she would have had to deal with. And um, but but I don't know that we can speak to any evidence of of her saying, "Darn it, how." how do I, how do I, how do I push through or stay in this game? She, she does seem to be re remarkably resilient, but again, that's her image that she puts forth in the autobiography. That is so fascinating. Um, thank you. Uh, John, uh, you have a question? Yes, I do. Um, thank you very much for this uh, wonderful presentation and congratulations on uh, on this very fascinating book. Um, I only had a chance to peruse it. Uh, it's very handsomely published. Uh, I think there are some six illustrations. And I wanted to kind of um, put the spotlight on the two of you for a moment, uh, the celebrity scholars, let's say, in this project. I had noticed in the acknowledgments, um, which is one frequently finds this, that you know there's a statement that it took too much time or it took longer than one had hoped. Uh, and But also what I was struck by was a very strong statement by one of you, I can't remember which, about praising collaboration, which I thought was a very beautiful thing. And so I, I do, and also I, I appreciated seeing the manuscripts in the presentation today, uh, you know, the textuality. Um, and so I wanted to invite you to kind of share with us a bit more about your scholarly, scholarly journey uh, you know, take us into the the archives that you worked in, the discoveries you made. Uh, you know, it, it was a scholarly adventure, I'm sure, for the two of you. And I wonder if you could just speak to us, share with us a bit more about that. 
I'll let you, Adrian, begin if you want. I will begin. Yes, I'm just going to uh, recall highlights because that's the best I can do in this moment. Um, um, we were in Venice together for some portion. I think uh, Irene has been in Italy much more often than I working on this and other of her projects. But uh, for the time we were in Venice together, we worked in the Correr Library there. We were at the um, um, Marciana uh, looking for, you know, looking for the actual Veronese's text and, and anthology she'd appeared in. Um, we were at the Ateneo, the, the Ateneo Veneto looking for her works. We, as as happens with everyone, you're in the card catalog, especially I remember the Correr and you've you, you're looking for one thing and then you you discover something else. And so the list kept growing that way. Um, and um, I'm trying to think, uh, we, we took some, I took some <laughs> beautiful photographs in a very, in a very small reading room at the Correr that has gorgeous windows overlooking the canal. I, I just add that in because there were moments I thought, how does it get better than this? I'm in this beautiful room. I'm smelling wood from who knows how long ago, mm. beautiful polished wood and old parchment. Mm. And we're, we're finding little unknown, you know, naughty epigrams. Of, <laughs> of, so the whole thing had its moments of just uh. joy and wonder and fun. Oh. Um, and I'm sure I'm forgetting a whole lot more about our archival work and, um, our hours and hours with the translation, we really put it, put each other through the mill. Mm. You know, Irene, the Italian native speaker, me, the English native speaker, and we we really wrestled with it, but that was fun too in its own way. Cool. I'll stop. I would Thank like you. to add, uh, just uh, in general, uh, you might have noticed uh, some weird things going on on the excerpts that we presented, like uh, orthography, right, commas, uh, capitalization, words that are mistakes. So we reproduced uh, exactly what the Veronese printed in her manuscript. We didn't uh, um, fix anything. Our translation is slightly improved. And Badindettini especially, she was horrible with the uh, commas and periods and all of that. So um, I just want to make clear, and we have uh, um, our um, rationale before presenting the book, uh, we um, elucidated that work. Um, I might add that uh, um, there was the Biblioteca Nazionale in Firenze where we worked. Uh, there was the uh, Biblioteca di Luca, um, where we went for Bandettini and to look at the manuscript, take pictures of the manuscript, because uh, our um, reproduction is based on the manuscript and not uh, on um, the later uh, reprint of that uh, um, reproduction of that manuscript. So, um, yeah, and the, the many parts of the book itself, because, uh, yeah, there is the translation, there is the notes, to make it a, a critical edition, to give the context. It was very important at that times. And for me, I felt privileged because uh, there are instances of Venetian dialect in there. So it's easy for me. I'm from Treviso. I'm from there. My family is from 10 miles away from where she was born, from Conegliano. So mm -hmm. I could understand, but still some things escaped me. And I was digging into my cultural roots. Um, so mm -hmm. it was a privilege that way too. You know, to bring it forward. Wow, thank you very much. That's great. Thank you. Thanks for the question, John. You're welcome. Wonderful. Um, I don't see any other question. Um, maybe I can ask you uh, one last comment. Um, we have talked about the afterlife or you know or the possibly missing afterlife of this text uh, so the circulation of texts uh, one thing that struck me deeply in the very first pages of the book is this incredible vision of this the oral and written or read read circulation of texts and stories that we have um, within the very low class environment uh, uh, that she opens up with, and then sort of this sort of really trans class circulation of texts and books that we have that is um, 
uh, I don't know, it, it really opens up, um, blows away all sort of prejudices or or even just, you know, the, the literacy data that we have for Italy in the 19th century. And yet here we are. This is a story that opens with um, a gardener who's um, sort of, I, I guess it's the owner of the hut. He's a printer, right? And so he does nothing but bring books to them and they just read books. And then they they read these, these Alteri tragedies to the peasants that work with them. Uh, it's like, it's an um, unbelievable circulation of words of narrative. And then the peasants that have read Alfieri use Alfieri to criticize the work and to complain about the work, right? Quote Alfieri to come. So it's 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 a wonderful way of recreating an entire universe really of, of word circulation. So I don't know if you have any thoughts to that you would like to close on with about that. No, I totally agree with you, Silvia. It's um, it's very interesting um, since the focus uh, for me was on social social networking to see how the circulation of uh, ideas, uh, but also books, uh, knowledge, uh, uh, knowledge forms, uh, manuscripts, uh, are you know permeating both the lower classes and the higher classes, and there is a. Um, I think of it as a trickle down effect. So when you have a, a, a waiter that is coming from England and he has uh, the service right. of a, a, a right. Venetian nobility and he yes. barely speaks any Italian, but he can declaim Shakespeare. And then you have the other people around hearing that and kind of translating it through his help and then reproducing. Um, it's super fascinating. So uh, the different the media for the diffusion of, uh, of knowledge that we can be also uh, not necessarily literary, but the cultural knowledge. Um, Veronese's uh, father, he obviously being a gardener, it meant that he was involved in the architectural and also ideological setup of gardens because gardens were a way yes. to show off a Venetian nobility in the 18th century power, right? So uh, the new plants, uh, the new advancements in agriculture, he discusses those uh, with people that he's his peer, and usually it's the priest in the village, and but uh, uh, very often also with the quote unquote more important people um, that come in that are passionate in astrology and then he will wake her up and take her out of the room at night to, to look at the stars right so we have uh, all these moments uh, that are really um, very interesting in how um, there is a there is an interchange of uh, um, literary uh, exchanges or and narrative exchanges narratives, yes absolutely mostly. yeah and I I'm remembering how she talks so much about how there's so much overlap where the statues in the garden or the frescoes in a villa are recreating these mythological stories. So the literature and the material manifestations are just are almost one and the same. You cannot yes. escape them. And she tells us that the peasants who are reading Ariosto are naming their children Rinaldo and Bramante. <laughs> and so the names of the kids are... <laughs> are taken from these stories, whether the peasants were able to read the whole story or they just heard the stories. Um, it's just, there's just so much uh, permeation, per permeable. -ness. Let's, uh, let's just end it with the fact that uh, the family dog was called, uh, named the Libri. The Libri? <laughs> Veronese's <laughs> dog as a child had as a name Libri. <laughs> Libri, yes. Yes, 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 that's wonderful. Um, so yes, we are, we have arrived at the end of a sort of allotted time. Uh, this was such a treat uh, for all of us. I, I think I can say for all of us. Um, thank you so much, Adrian, once again, and Irene for um, for sharing with us your your passion, your discovery, and these and Veronese's and Bandettini's texts, so interesting. Um, as I mentioned at the beginning, we are we'll see you uh, in the beginning of November with the second event of the lecture series. Um, and thank you to all of you in the audience for being with us. Have a wonderful, wonderful weekend. Grazie, grazie tantissime. Thank grazie. you all grazie. so much. Grazie. Thank you. Grazie infinite.